I'd like to start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. I acknowledge their continuing contribution to this place and to this institution. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Anne Evans. I'm the Associate Dean of Research in the College of Arts and Social Sciences, and I welcome you to this professorial lecture. The CAS inaugural professorial lecture series is an opportunity for us as a community to welcome and celebrate new professorial appointments to our college. Today, we celebrate the promotion of Professor Simone Dennis from the School of Archaeology and Anthropology in the Research School of Humanities and the Arts. So, congratulations, Simone. <laughs> It's with pleasure today that we've joined forces with the ANU Gender Institute, as this is the first event in their series on the inspiring women of ANU. And the Gender Institute have a newsletter which you can sign up for here, if I'm sure most of us are already signed up for that, um, for that newsletter. Simone completed her PhD at the University of Adelaide and has held positions at Adelaide, University of Southern Queensland and at the ANU. Her research interests coalesce around embodiment, the sense and power. She's written on how the politics of nationhood in contemporary Australia have played out for Christmas Island's multi-ethnic populations. She's spent time with Persian women migrants who have fled Iran in the past two decades. And she's conducted research in the techno-scientific spaces of major Australian research laboratories in which mice and rats feature as animal models for human disease research. Simone is best known for her work that's contained in her fourth book, which looks closely at how the air itself is central to ushering in legislative changes that impact more than just smoking and that affect us all. She is just about to embark on a major funded project on alcohol use, but she says she will probably draw the line at guns. <laughs> Simone embodies the values of the ANU in research excellence, risk-taking and collegiality. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dennis. Thanks, Anne, very much. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming. I, I had written a, a long uh, piece of thank yous at the start of my paper, but it started to sound like I was accepting an Academy Award. So um, please consider yourself thanked, um, and I will do that properly later on. But I would like to start off by asking you please to lower your expectations of this professorial lecture, because it's still not clear to me that I actually should be a professor. After all, it was only Frank Bongiorno's sage advice that I shouldn't wear a fascinator and take real-time bets as to the outcome of my interview just because it was going to be held on Melbourne Cup Day. <laughs> so without that advice, I may very well not be standing before you today. Also on the day of my interview, I attempted to walk in through the outdoor of the Menzies Library where my interview took place. I managed to turn that around, I think, by suggesting to people who witnessed the event namely the Dean, that this was an example of real leadership. I was not being a follower and trailing behind all those conventional thinkers who went in the indoor. That's what I mean when I say, please lower your expectations. So what I'm going to try and do in my lecture is to tell you about why I think it's important to research smoking. First, I'm going to tell you that it's important to my own discipline of anthropology, which I hope will tell you something about my own vision for the future of that discipline. And second, I want to make the much bigger argument that researching smoking in a particular way lets us see some of the things that are being done that look like bounded attempts to curtail a dangerous habit, but which are having a much bigger and more profound effect than we can see on the surface. And I, I want to argue to you that those effects should matter to all of us. So I'm not suggesting this because I've got a particular view on smoking. When I started my research on smoking 15 years ago, I was really interested to know what effects this very large and detailed suite of um, legislation would have on people, on the people it was directed at, smokers themselves. I wasn't interested in getting those people to stop smoking, and I wasn't interested in sticking up for their rights to smoke. Another way of saying that is that I'm loathed by everybody in this space. I get a lot of hate mail, I get banned from journals, I get confronted um, in personal ways at conferences, but that to me is data. 
And it's data that demonstrates just how polarised the field of tobacco research is and how that polarisation has shaped the research that now occurs within its parameters. So I want to start off by saying that I don't work within those parameters. Now that doesn't mean that I'm a detached observer with privileged access to this space or to the truth of it, but it does mean that I've stepped outside the war between public health and tobacco companies to instead study the conditions under which that war is conducted and the smoker around who that battle, and whom that battle occurs. So in this, I differ from the vast majority of anthropologists looking at smoking. And it is, in fact, from within their ranks that the bulk of my hate mail journal bannings and conference confrontations issue. None of the anthropologists here today, of course, are all accepted. Um, and that's because the vast majority of anthropological work on smoking cannot be described as tobacco research at all. Instead, it's better described as tobacco control research. Now, that research is conducted entirely within a public health paradigm that aims to bring about smoking cessation. Now, don't get me wrong, stopping smoking is a good thing, right? I'm not arguing um, that we should stop doing that. Uh, and we should do research on, on smoking cessation. But it does become problematic, I think, when the intention to stop people from smoking comes to constitute the paradigmatic tone of the entire field to the extent that no other inquiry can be made in that field. There's no doubt that there's a very manifest feeling circulating among anthropologists of smoking that you're either with us or you're against us. That is, with us in ridding the world of the tobacco scourge or against us on the side or even the payroll of big tobacco, which is something I'm regularly accused of. But why did this happen? How did this, this situation come to pass? There's a few reasons for this that are really quite interesting to consider. So first of all, a good deal of the anthropological refusal to deal with smoking outside of a public health aligned commitment to reducing the practice has to do with fears over how any research which produces findings critical of public health aims might be pressed into the service of a tobacco, um, of a pro-tobacco interest. So it's become impossible nearly now to write anything about, say, smoking pleasure. That's a really difficult thing to write. Or what smoking might accomplish for people without writing also about how those things might be counted or replaced with something else. In the case, uh, the, it, and that's just in case the tobacco industry uses academic authority to endorse a libertarian agenda supporting free choice and the pursuit of pleasure, which they are known to do. I know from bitter experience that that's, just, that's not a, a fear that's just rehearsed. It's in fact made manifest in correspondence directed, for example, to me demanding full retractions of articles I've written about smoking pleasure, demands to journal editors at the review stage that articles be pulled since I'm in the pay of big tobacco, and even death threats. So thankfully, those death threats, though, invariably issue from the members of a foaming at the mouth anti-tobacco organisation that will, for this purpose remain nameless, um, it's, it's really good that they're not very good at issuing these death threats. Um, and this is because, as far as I can make out, that they're not very good at spelling. So nearly everyone that I've got from them has a spelling error. So quite against the advice of a new security, my response has been to correct the spelling of the death threats and then send them back to where they've come from. Um, I haven't got one for a while because the last one was diabolical. Okay, so that's the first reason. We don't want to do research that gets drawn into the interests of, of pro-tobacco. So the second one has to do with the way that anthropology makes itself relevant and worthy in the world. Now, certainly pursuing laudable agendas is attractive and helping to do something good like rid the world of the tobacco scourge not only makes anthropological pursuits worthy, it also makes them relevant and understandable to the public to which we're increasingly asked to appeal. I know that as well because as a first year teacher of anthropology, I often get people uh, ring up, parents, who say, OK, so Tina is taking anthropology this semester. I don't know what that is, but can you tell me what kind of job she might get from it? Right, so people want to know what the relevance of anthropology is because they often come to us without having heard of it before. So this is, um, that reason has to do with also the fact that funding tends to flow to research projects that do some good in the world and have some purchase in that way. So it's good to do something that the public appreciates, understands. The third reason has got to do with how anthropology tries to demystify people who appear to outsiders to do inexplicable and sometimes quite weird things. 
Now, in many respects, it is very weird to cut up some leaves which have been dried out and put them in a bit of paper and smoke them. That's weird, isn't it? That's a bit weird. Especially if doing that might hurt you or might even kill you. That's even weirder. Now, if you were the Australian government, you would think that people do this because the biotechnology of cigarettes is good at appealing to human bodies and because people do not know that smoking is bad for them. And if they do know that, then they don't know in enough depth that it's bad for them. So that's the current um, government position, that people are ignorant of all of the effects that tobacco smoking can have on the body. And they're also a little bit inclined to take it because tobacco reacts with the human body so well. So you would also think, if you were the government, that this can be disrupted to some extent by pharmacological inputs like nicotine replacement patches, but primarily by public education campaigns. So in this view, the smoker has fallen into a dangerous relationship with tobacco, but she is also a rational agent who, when given the right information, can make a rational choice to quit. Right? So when she gets enough information or the right kind of information about how dangerous it actually is, she'll stop. Now, there's no doubt that the presentation of pretty scary health information has worked, right? There's, there's not very much doubt about that. So today, we're sitting in Canberra, a site of one of the lowest smoking rates in the country, and in the, indeed in the Western world. 20 years ago, the number was about 20, 22%, right? So it's pretty high, and now it's under half that figure, right? So it's about nine, so it's pre that's pretty low. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the poor side of that, obesity has gone up. I'm, I'm wanting to wonder, wonder if that's, there's a link there, but uh, yeah, maybe not. So we've got a pretty low rate, right? Um, and it's worth comparing these as well. So nationally, in the early 90s, it was around 30%, and just after World War II, it was about 75%, right? So you've got all these really interesting drops, and they're pretty easy to peg against the public health information campaigns that have come out. Um, so those campaigns that did the most of the work, as everyone will know, were based on something called health facticity. Right, so health facticity is the presentation of unassailable medical facts and they're presented to trump the lived experience of smoking a cigarette. So that might be quite pleasurable, it might be quite nice, but you compare it with the, the facts of what's going on inside the body, this might stop you from thinking that those nice effects of having a cigarette are not worth it. Right, so these, um, it used to be the case that on your packet of cigarettes, there was some text that said smoking caused lung cancer or, or, or one of the other smoking related illnesses. But now we know we've got these. Um, these, are, these are the images that um, people would be familiar with, right? So they're fairly graphic and when they came out, they really caused a splash. People were um, you know, shocked by these images, which is of course the effect they were meant to have. But you might not know that medical doctors were engaged to educate the advertising firm that made these images, that was hired by the government, um, about the effects of smoking on the interior of the body. So it's a range of effects, and these are the ones that were plucked out as being kind of the most terrifying ones that you might experience, right? So you've probably all got your favourites. Uh, one of my favourites is I, um, this second one. Um, I've got lots of informants in my research who are blue-eyed smokers and they won't buy that packet, right, because it looks back at them and it makes them feel a bit shit, so they don't buy it. Um, but other people have got other favourites and some of these are worse than others. So this third one, you might know, that's Brian. Um, so Brian died of lung cancer um, very quickly after he was diagnosed and Brian has his own Facebook page, his own website, he's dead, but he's got his own things. And uh, Brian came up a lot during my research and one of the things that came up the most was that people thought Brian was a bit of a wuss, right? Smokers thought Brian was a bit of a wuss because he had died so quickly and he couldn't handle fags. So um, he's, an, he's an interesting kind of character. Um, the other thing that's often said about Brian is that he looked better and a bit more like Michael Stipe after he had cancer and a bit worse beforehand where he had a mullet. So, you know, it's an, an interesting array of packages and what I'm trying to tell you is that responses to these vary. Right, so they don't necessarily have the health effects you think that they have when they're presented. And I'm going to talk about that a bit more later. So anyway, um, medical doctors were engaged to educate the advertising firm hired by the government to produce those images. And the images were, of course, designed to portray what really happens when a person smokes and to disrupt how smoking might feel with the grim reality of the practice. Now, that's a hard thing to do because a lot of the effects of smoking happen inside the body and they're not seeable to you, in, especially in the course of having a cigarette. And at least that was the thinking in the late 90s. That was how we thought about cigarettes in the late 90s, that you couldn't see these things and, and you had to um, make them be seen to be believed. So nothing, of course, is more authoritative than that visual mode of health facticity when those images are medical. 
Okay, so despite these indisputable successes of, of this campaign in particular, anthropologists have nevertheless been roundly critical of the rational agent who can see those things and then make a choice to stop. Their argument has been that agents are not automatons who will simply respond as predicted to information and actions designed to get them to quit. Agents, they said, are instead best understood as inextricably intertwined in their social worlds, and these must be properly understood in order for cessation campaigns to be successful. Now that's pretty important and particularly important because there's a clear social gradient in smoking. Australia is on the numbers a predominantly white middle class country, so there are more white middle class smokers than anybody else on the numbers. But percentage wise, the picture is clear in Australia and across the Western world that smoking is disproportionately prominent in the lower socioeconomic registers. Right? It's really clear as well that some populations smoke more than others. So here we're talking about Aboriginal populations, especially living in rural and remote settings, uh, migrant communities, and impoverished people of other, other um, kind of um, backgrounds. So public health campaigns had to date um, been made by white middle class people for white middle class people. And anthropologists were a bit upset by that um, situation. Um, and they thought that campaigns uh, must be made for culturally and specifically um, socioeconomically specific groups um, on potentially quite different grounds than these. So you might not make an appeal on health facticity grounds, you might make an appeal on some other grounds that were more appropriate to the people that you wanted to reach. Um, and the view was formed, and it's been formed in, um, by a number of different people independently, uh, but it's this one. For Aboriginal people, smoking suspends and implicates them in webs of cultural meaning and social exchange. So that's produced um, all the time as a, as a particular way of thinking about Aboriginal relations with smoke and with cigarettes. So it follows from that, and this is the next thing that anthropologists have been um, active in saying, it makes rational sense for Aboriginal people to have a smoke if their goal is to be socially and materially entailed in their community. So they're saying it makes sense for people to smoke, right? It's rational. If you want to get them to stop, you have to show not how cigarettes will impact their insides like that, you've got to show them instead how cigarettes destroy the social networks that they hold so dear, right? So that's the thinking. And you might know that that resulted in, oh, how come this is not working? Evans, I need you, quick. Can you do that? Because it's really important. <laughs> I'm relying on the next picture quite heavily. Okay, so you might know it culminated in this campaign. Now, that, that woman is, no, is called by the government in the campaign Indigenous Woman. That's her name, right? So that's Indigenous Woman, um, and she is part of the Break the Chain campaign, um, which was done in the early 2000s. So I don't know if you've ever seen it. Does anyone remember this campaign? It's got a really interesting set of text uh, that goes with it, and I'm reading here from the government website. Indigenous Woman, I watched Pop die, lung cancer from smoking. Mum had a heart attack from her smoking. And then we see a picture of her family and her voice grows softer with concern for their health. Indigenous woman, my sis and Uncle Barry have trouble breathing. She looks sadly over her sick neighbour's house. Indigenous woman, Rosie next door had a stroke and the doctor said it was from smokes. And I was smoking for years too, but I quit. We see her own children playing happily in contrast to the illness and worry that she is experiencing. And this is, this is all off the website, right? This is what the government um, text is. So Indigenous woman, because I don't want our kids growing up thinking disease and dying like that is normal. She looks direct at camera, strong and determined to change her smoking habits for the good of her community. Indigenous woman, if I can do it, I reckon we all can. And she's doing it in this kind of voice that's relatable, right? That, and it's a particularly chosen voice, right, to make it relatable. Now, the ad ends there and then people are um, advised that they should call the quit line if they want help. Right, which has a specific dedicated Indigenous section that you can access. Now that's a really interesting uh, ad. I happened to be watching it one day with an Indigenous friend who said, Jesus, that woman is so dangerous that even living next door to her means that you could die. Right? So he thought she was the problem and she was, uh, if you were near her, then you would you know, suffer in some way. Now he was joking, right? He was taking the piss and, and, th and making that a funny kind of remark. But it was an interesting thing to say because clearly he recognised that sociality was at the core of this, but he was talking about the wrong sort. Okay, so what's happening here is that anthropological work, which informed this ad and others like it, translates inexplicable behaviour, like continuing to smoke, even though it might kill you and even though it's expensive, 
Deep ethnographic work reveals why people are actually doing that. It's because smoking is the key to sociality. And once you know that, it makes sense and the rational, the agents become rational. So it becomes explicable. We know why they're doing it and then we can make a campaign to help them to stop it. Now that goes right back to Malinovskian revelations based on ethnographic work that revealed, for example, Trobian Islanders to not be primitive, but to be civilised persons, right? Or like civilised persons in the sense that their behaviour made sense, their rituals made sense, and you shouldn't compare them on unequal grounds. So it's a really long-standing notion in our disciplinary kind of context. So that understanding of context is very important. And it has meant that we can't make distinctions ever since that time on the differences between people unless we understand their context. And that tends to level things, right? But that, and that's an advantageous position, but it's got some drawbacks. So in 2003, the anthropologist Bruce Kepfer urged anthropologists to think carefully about those drawbacks. Right? He thought that the consequences of classical anthropological translations came in the form of closing down alternative methods and modes of inquiry that might provide us with different insights into those social worlds than we, than we had. Nigel Rappel also has contributed to that discussion and has made a much more recent urging in the development of his concept of distortion, a form of complex connectedness that escapes the bounds of relationality, of structuration and systematics, as is currently construed in much social science. The internal consistency that anthropologists often rely on to explain social worlds could fall apart, he thought. Capra's well-known complaint is that anthropologists invariably try to explain things like magic, witchery and source, witchcraft and sorcery as a mechanism for releasing social tension and explaining misfortune, or else a psychological expression of desire when one has no control over the world. But what if the operations of magic and witchcraft and sorcery worked instead to offer people new understandings of their worlds? And he thought they might do that by forcing things together that are normally kept apart. And I wondered that of Michelle, a girl I encountered in Adelaide in the early 2000s when she was just 16 and eight months pregnant and a heavy smoker. Brazenly, Michelle was smoking in the street and that, of course, led me to ask her for an interview because how could you pass that up if we're interested in smoking and there's this woman, you know, about to pop who happens by. So, of course, I rushed her and asked her for an interview. Now, she told me that she'd learned from the new warning labels that she'd seen on her friend's packet of Winnie Blues that smoking could reduce the birth weight of your baby. So she had taken it up. That's because, and I'm quoting her here, the thing I'm most afraid of in the world is having a big baby and it ripping me end from end. Right? So that's pretty scary. She was a slight woman. Some people in the back are crying. That's okay, Beck, don't worry. Um, and she wanted to make sure it got smaller. Right? So um, I think I've, it's this one. Or one like it, right? So on the bottom there, you can see um, problems during the birth of your baby having a smaller brain and body. So that's, that's something she wanted to do. So she wanted to solve this problem. Now, this is tempting, right, to analyse, and I did analyse it originally this way, that uh, we, we're looking at someone who was trying to wrest control over the world, this small, scared person desperately responding to an increased loss of control over the world with magic packets. Right? Just like Capra's subjects made what control they could over their social worlds, we might say that Michelle was acting entirely rationally. She was smoking to make a small baby so as not uh, to rip end to end during childbirth. That's a, that's a quite interesting um, idea. And it's true that Michelle was buying these packets in particular as though they were particularly good at doing this work of reducing the baby's size. She would reject packets that didn't have that label on them as though they were infused with some magical baby shrinking force of their own, right? So that's, a, that's an interesting kind of strategy. But there are other explanations on offer, I think. Michelle's use of public health messaging effectively fused two very different registers of meaning and reasoning together, the world of public health and its authority of insights into what smoking does to unborn babies and Michelle's own smoking. Now, those two things were never, ever meant to come into contact with one another in such a way that a public health warning could justify smoking. That is never how they were intended to be used. And it provoked horror among public health officials when they found out about this particular practice. In what world can an anti-smoking warning validate smoking? How can this happen? But of course, in Michelle's world, those things could occur, did, and effectively made a new world for Michelle in which she started to try to influence that baby, right, under her own hand. And she wanted to see 
how it would respond to her when she tried to influence it. She was deeply interested in whether the baby that she could not yet see would do what she wanted it to do or whether, to quote her again, it would be like its bloody father and be huge and stubborn. Strangely, the headline, Smoking Gives Pregnant Mothers Insight into Who Their Babies Are, wasn't the headline that the Sunday Telegraph ran with when it came across this part of my research. Instead, it went with exclusive, teen mums smoke in bid to deliver tiny babies, and I was inundated with media attention for the month. The point is that only the latter headline is permissible in the world of tobacco control research, right? And that is validated by a long-standing anthropological desire to translate inexplicable worlds of others in rational terms. But there are other things we can see besides Michelle's baby when we abandon the internal consistency that Capfra and Rapport each complain about, and these are the things that I think we should all be worried about. So to explain what these things are and why we should worry about them, I want to go back to a remark I made a little bit earlier. I said that when the ad series including eye and tongue and aorta and brain came out, they were specifically designed to get people to think about what smoking really does to the body as opposed to what it feels like to have a cigarette. And I remarked that this was tricky because most of the damage smoking wreaks occurs inside the personal body, or at least it was thought to in the 1990s when those ads first came out. Now those ads share in common a focus on the insides of the smoker's body. In my personal favourite, aorta, actually this is a better picture of it, aorta, uh, for instance, um, we witness a gloved hand extruding the thick white paste that has built up inside the aorta resultant of smoking. You can tell I really like talking about this, right? Um, it's, it's a really lovely image, especially when it's moving, which I haven't decided to do to you today because it is quite gross. Um, and so it just kind of squeezes out like a tube of toothpaste. And the, the people who made the ad refer to that as brie cheese gunk, just in case you're planning to have... I don't know if we have brie cheese after this, do we? Yeah. Okay, good. So <laughs> that's good. Think about that when you're eating your brie cheese. And so this... Um, this is a really nice image. And then there's another one dubbed stroke or brain, and that features a bloody stroke in progress. There, there it is. Uh, there's a close-up of the, of the, the blood. Uh, from lung, oozes a viscous brown liquid described in image captioning and a voiceover in the television version as rot in progress. That's what rot looks like. Um, in the, this is not a very good picture, but in a better one, you can see it's black, like the, the um, damaged uh, cells lung sacs are, are actually blackened, um, and that's called rot in progress. And the copy for the ad, that ad in particular says, no wonder smokers feel short of breath. That's because their lungs are rotting, right? You probably remember this. Now, these ads, for which, which were designed for telly, aired from 1997 to 2004 and began with the smoker drawing in smoke, right, in a single breath, and then the viewer gets to follow that smoke down inside the body until it is uh, yielded up right, as exhalation. But it only films the process of inhalation. You only get to see what it does inside the body. You don't get to see what happens after the smoke is, is exhaled. So the ads are trying to get across the idea that smoking causes damage inside the body of the smoker. But since 2004, following scientific findings regarding the status of secondhand smoke, the focus of ad advertising, anti-smoking advertising, legislation and public health campaigns has dramatically shifted to what the smoker's exhaled smoke does to other people, right? So they're no longer interested in this and you won't see these ads anymore. This change is referred to in formal policy contexts as the process of denormalisation. Denormalisation is that purposeful change in the interpretation of smoking from a widely practised and socially acceptable behaviour to one which is increasingly typified as destructive, dirty and antisocial to give the federal government's exact definition of it. So is anyone here a smoker? Yeah, look out. I'm talking to you. So, denormalisation is uh, manifest in a multiple of legislative forms that make particularly evident the dirtiness of smoking, and you may have experienced some of these things, right? Smoke free public space legislation, for instance, constrains smoking to a certain shrinking area of um, public outdoors. The current National Tobacco Strategy, which is a five year plan that details the government's legislative and public health education agenda for smoking prevalence, asserts that more and more areas will become smoke free, and that, and I'm quoting them here, smoke free public spaces have become the norm in line with public awareness of the risks of inhaling secondhand smoke, and that has dramatically increased. So they think the public is more aware, and it's, it clearly is. Now, I want you to note well the language used by the government to describe the smoke that issues from the smoker. It's called secondhand smoke. Now, they could 
call it something else, but they never do. So we have to start off with the idea that three sorts of tobacco smoke are produced in the course of having a fag. The first one is mainstream smoke, and that's the smoke inhaled into the smoker's lungs, right? So when you're drawing in. Exhaled mainstream smoke is the smoke that they breathe out from their lungs. And then you've got sidestream smoke, which is the smoke that escapes that route and comes out through the tip of the, the burning end of the cigarette. Exhaled mainstream smoke and sidestream smoke can both be described as environmental tobacco smoke, but they never are in government documents. They're always called secondhand smoke. And that's on purpose, right? That's because only the term secondhand smoke captures the repulsive notion that the smoke that is breathed in has been used before, right? It is secondhand, okay? That's pretty gross. So it's emerged as well, we know from watching the ads, from a particularly revolting body that's got rotted lungs, right? So not only is it secondhand, it's also been used by this particular set of disgusting lungs. Now, uh, no wonder smokers feel short of breath, their lungs are rotting, proclaims this television voiceover, as I told you. No wonder, or even less of a wonder, that during my own study into how Australian smokers have experienced this denormalisation, that I frequently encountered non-smokers passing by smokers who would do things like draw up their collars, put their hands over their face, or abuse people in the street to protect themselves from this. Have you, has this ever happened to you? Yeah, I'm very sorry. So um, I've got lots and lots of data on this, but my favourite one is uh, when it happened to one informant of mine called Rosie, um, who was having a fag, blew out her smoke, a man happened by and said, hey, don't you blow that stinking shit on me. I do not want your cancer. It's contagious now. Right? So that's the extent to which people might think that smoking or drawing in secondhand smoke is dangerous. Now, air interconnects all breathers. Right? What is exhaled by one will be breathed in another, by another, but this repulsive fact is backgrounded in the course of ordinary respiration. You probably weren't thinking before about how that's happening in here, but it is, right? You're doing it now. And normally we don't think about that because that would make it awkward, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> like a lot of things. But, um, but a smoker's odiferous exhalations make revoltingly clear that we're all interconnected because you can see it and you smell it, right? Now, the problem with odour is that we don't detect it until it's entered our bodies, right? So by then it's too late. Once you've, once you've sm if you've smelled it, it's too late. It's already in you, right? And then it has breached our bodily boundaries. And when things do that, those things are often conceived of as dangerous, right? They're, they're breaches, they get through our defences, and they're often dangerous or thought to be dangerous. Now, because it can do that, the smell of smoke has proved more than enough to create the embodied sense that secondhand smoke is really dangerous to breathe in, right, because of that property. In fact, the government has relied entirely on the smell of smoke to make that claim because secondhand smoke in the outdoors is not really dangerous to inhale at all. It is verifiably dangerous to breathe in in the indoors. There's absolutely sound science that says if you're breathing this in inside, you're in trouble, right, and this will make you sick. This will result in, in verifiable and, and documentable diseases. But it's really different in the outside where the legislation is now all happening. So as Australian scientists Stafford, Daub and Franklin, and Daub is Mike Daub, who is a very staunch anti-smoking campaigner, right? So he, this is his science, and I'm quoting him. In contrast to indoor smoking, secondhand smoke dissipates really quickly after the smoke ceases, outdoor, after smoking ceases outdoors. The concentration of outdoor secondhand smoke is a product of the density and distribution of smokers, wind direction and speed, and the stability of the atmosphere. High outdoor secondhand smoke concentrations are generated by high smoke density, low wind velocity, and stable atmospheric conditions. So you have to try really hard, right? To get enough to cause harm. There have to be enough smokers in the space. You have to be downwind of them, and they've got to stay there, and you've got to stay there, and you've got to breathe in at the right minute. So it's pretty hard to do, right? The government hasn't needed that science anyway, right? It isn't there, and they haven't needed it. But it has fundamentally altered how people make claims on the air, which seems like a shared resource shared equally, <laughs> but might actually be differentially accessed and, and understood. We know this, of course, from the fact that those of us who have the least social and economic leverage live in the most polluted places, because you've got to, right? In the context of smoking, differential claims on the air impact the most intimate of relations with the air itself. It impacts how people do their breathing. I realised this as I interviewed Natalia, a 47-year-old office worker in Canberra. As I listened back to my recording of our interview to write it up, I recalled how when she, I realised how when she drew in on her cigarette, Natalia's smoke emerged around her words. And she said things like, it's hard. She said, I, I feel it's shameful because... And then she stopped. It was weird. It was a weird kind of um, cessation of the recording. It sounded like she'd stopped talking and breathing out. 
And she had, in fact, ceased exhaling. And that's because someone walked past. So she held her breath in so she didn't have to um, exhale into their respiratory right of way, right? Because she knew she'd be abused if she did. So um, this woman who happened past looked briefly across at us, coughed loudly and theatrically, pulled her jumper up, gave us the finger and moved on, right? So no wonder you don't want to exhale into that because you're probably going to get slapped. So Natalia had held her breath and her speech until that woman had passed by. Now that recording prompted me to check others and there were dozens of them that I'd made and they were, these punctuations were everywhere, right? That people had stopped talking while I was talking to them in the street. So acute attendance to the waft of the air and to the respiratory right of way of non-smokers in the era of smoke-free speaks powerfully to the political dimensions of the air itself and who might dominate that. That's perhaps best expressed as well in the fact that the air has lots of contaminants in it, but it is assumed to be pure and unsullied until cigarette smoke gets into it, and then it's a problem, it's a polluted problem. You'll notice probably that our own smoke-free campus information asks us to keep the air pure and clean by not smoking, as though it were not um, you know, sullied before. So those whose breathing is conducted in deference to the rights of the non-smoker and whose rotting emanations are considered the primary pollutant of a previously clean air are increasingly constrained within particular space. Specifically, they're allowed to conduct their filthy breathing, sorry, only within areas classified as public land. Now that category, to that category of public land belong things like vacant lots, footpaths, curbsides, interstitial nowhere spaces that tend to already gather the marginalised. The production of material and odiferous pollution in those shrinking marginal spaces in the form of cigarette litter and odour confirms the thesis of the smoker's filth. Right? So if they weren't dirty before, they are now, because look at the mess. Public land stands in contrast with public space where civic activity is intended to be carried out and in which the body, public body forms up. Smoke-free public space legislation seems on the face of it to be democratic in the sense that it seeks to secure the quality and integrity of the air for all breathers. But it's profoundly changed how and which already marginalised people can participate in the public, where and how they can breathe. As Brandt reminds us, this shares much with prior attempts to segregate one group of people considered polluting and dangerous from a dominant group, erroneously considered to be at risk from their presence. And of course, he's controversially talking about the Jim Crow era in the American South when he says that. In short, we're mucking about with who can and cannot be the public under legislation with quite another name. Now you might say that even if the odour of cigarette smoke is not dangerous when encountered in the outdoors, it's still offensive. Right? It's still invasive and it shouldn't be allowed in the air for that reason. But if you do think that, consider the expansion of scent-free public spaces that ban strong odour lest they cause offence. Strong perfume, body odour and distinctive food odours are already banned in a number of public spaces, including conference venues, public transport vehicles and so on. Those odours too tend to be borne by the socially and economically marginal and by the non-white other Cheap, musky perfumes, unwashed bodies and alien food smells belong to others, not to the white middle classes. With its increasing deodorisation, a distinctive middle class smell is beginning to characterise public space and it doesn't smell like anything. This is perhaps confirmed by the fact that by far the biggest selling room deodoriser in Australia and America is not a scented spray, but instead a product that eliminates odours before you get to smell them. That's a sensitive middle class nose right there. <laughs> middle classes maybe have no smell. You might then say to me, oh, well, smokers can in fact circulate in public space. It's only when they have a lit cigarette in their hands that they're a problem and that they experience any censure at all. But they don't, right? Thanks to the emergence of something called third hand smoke. Now, according to the Mayo Clinic, which gives the kind of most basic definition, Third-hand smoke is, and I'm quoting them here, residual nicotine and other chemicals left on a variety of indoor surfaces by tobacco smoke. This residue is thought to react with common indoor pollutants to create a toxic mix. Studies show that third-hand smoke clings to hair, skin, clothes, furniture, drapes, walls, beddings, hair, skin, all this stuff, right? And um, long after smoking has stopped. And you can't get rid of it. You can't expunge it, right? So no one's sitting next to this guy, right? Maybe because he's... <laughs> so you see that? He, and he's now a 
considered to be a contaminant. Now, that's, that's a really interesting and horrible thing to tell you about, right? And maybe you didn't know it before, but it is, it's starting to get real purchase in public space. So in California, for example, it's very common to go into a hotel and see a plaque in the lobby that says, at one time we permitted smoking in this hotel, we've replaced the curtains, we've replaced the carpets, we've washed it out, but it's still dangerous, right? Because it's got this third-hand smoke circulating around. So you can tell from that that this, the, the idea is that it lasts forever because we don't know how long it actually lasts for and that it's extremely dangerous, right? Extremely dangerous, almost as dangerous as uh, smoking itself. Now, there have been some studies about how long third-hand smoke might remain um, after smoking has stopped. Um, and the one that I'm thinking of is conducted by George Matt, who's a third-hand smoke researcher in the US, um, and he uh, concluded that even being, um, after being vacant for two months, a house being make, vacant for two months, being prepared for new residents with new carpeting and paint, third-hand smoke residue is still detectable. So they'd moved out the smoking residents, painted it, or did all this stuff, and it was still detectable. But detectability is different from danger, right? So just because you know it's there doesn't mean that we can prove that it causes a danger. Um, and that's really interesting because that, again, similar with secondhand smoke, has not stopped claims being made for its danger and for those being rehearsed and in some cases carried out in the social world. So this is particularly problematic because infants and children are considered particularly susceptible to this contamination because they like to crawl around on the ground and be in contact with the carpet and, and clothes and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so there has been a kind of moral panic around this and I have accessed this by looking at parenting websites. I don't know if any of you have ever been on one of these, but they're very terrifying. So <laughs> one new mother poster to the Australian What to Expect site uh, expressed great trepidation about telling her smoking father-in-law about the conditions under which he would be permitted to touch her newborn daughter, right? What should she do, she asked. The post, this post, sums up the advice. Why on earth wouldn't you say something to him? Don't worry about his feelings. If some dirty smoker stuck their finger in my baby's mouth, or in fact even touched it, their life would not be worth living. Isn't standing up for your health and the well-being of your baby more important than upsetting your stupid father-in-law? Do not let him touch her. Right. So this is followed up with advice from doctors on the site who um, advise that if there's a smoker in the family and you've had a baby, then that smoker should glove up wear a mask and a surgical gown. And, and they, if they don't have those things, they should wash their mouth out, wash them, sit, have a shower, change their clothes, right? And, and preferably just not smoke or not come over, okay? So father-in-law's life, I think, may well not be worth living um, under those conditions if, in fact, new mother did not let him touch the baby. The consequences would be pretty severe because touch is the very sensory foundation upon which the institution of family is constructed and maintained, right? So like other institutions, family is premised on and defined by fleshy interrelations. And it's those repetitive relations between specific body parts of one body to another that create and maintain the social body of the family and other ones like the military and uh, um, factory floors in late capitalism. As Collins puts it, the most repetitive behaviours that make up the family structure are the facts that, somewhat heteronormatively, the same men and women sleep in the same beds, the same children are kissed and spanked and fed. They're touched and they touch back, right? So that's family. So those touches um, conform to corporeal codes that are immediately understood as the space and time a body has to occupy in the family. But it's not just within families that we might see these touches codified um, and validated. We might see them in other areas as well. However unsubstantiated, claims for the danger of third-hand smoke shape relations of touch outside the family with just as significant implications. The executive director of Action on Health and Smoking, conveniently acronised to ASH, has already foreshadowed the legal possibility that people with a family history of cancer may be entitled to smoke-free places, restaurants, workplaces and any other places that they frequent. That entitlement would require smoke-free staff, and by that I mean not just people who've quit smoking, but people who have never smoked, because we don't know how long this contaminant lasts. That's an interesting idea because this means that smoke does something very unsmoke-like. It stays put and it stays, right? Whereas if it's a, in the combustible, smoky form, then it goes away and it drips. Third-hand smoke stays, um, perhaps forever. So anyone employed in a job like that would violate the conditions that people are entitled to, to have a smoke-free workplace or a smoke-free restaurant or any other kind of um, place in public. 
This has already been tested. Um, as Tobacco.org reported in June 2009, a US federal court forced a university to protect a woman and her unborn child whose health was threatened by third-hand smoke residue on the clothing of an office mate. One doctor providing a statement to the court submitted that the woman's sensitivity was to the tobacco smoke residue on the person, of not just his clothing, but on the person, so maybe his hair, maybe his skin, um, and therefore to protect the woman's health, this man should not be allowed to share an office space with her and he was summarily dismissed, right, and the case was upheld. So that decision indicates that third-hand smoke can reach out to touch others, even the unborn, via off-gas moving out from the smoker. And now there are um, campaigns and um, all sorts of things circulating in public space about the dangerousness of these people. So I've seen from the ASH website, for example, um, smokers' breath can be harmful to health. Don't sit next to them on the bus. Protect your family. Don't become complacent, right? No, most non-smokers are exposed. As they circulate among us, smokers have become, as George Matt, that researcher I mentioned before, has dubbed them mobile tobacco contamination packages. Right? I don't know how this makes you feel, but probably bad. So um, this codification, made in and through touch, is that smokers are quite literally not to be touched and you shouldn't touch them. Now this emergent coding for touch is highly consequential for our definitions of the public. Already across the Western world, as I've said, smokers are increasingly located on the lowest rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, and they've been prevented from practicing smoking in public space by legislative force on what I've suggested to you are the false bases of articulated danger of second and third hand smoke inhalation. Resultantly, those already marginalised bear the additional burden of relegation to public land where you can still smoke. But the purported danger of third hand smoke is not to be contained by means of, means of spatial segregation. Right? It is instead to be controlled by excluding the person to whom residue sticks and from whom off-gas emits for who knows how long, lest they endanger us all. They may well become untouchables. Now, as I said at the beginning of this talk, which I'm now going to bring to a close, it's really hard to write about those untouchables without appearing to undermine laudable cessation work. But I think we've got to, lest we let the public become an even narrower definition than it already is for it has never belonged to us all. To me, at least, we must continue to examine the conditions under which the public is constructed and who is allowed in and out of it, for we may all be imperiled by the narrowing of those parameters. This doesn't mean that I'm advocating you to go out and stick up for the rights of smokers, right? But it probably means we have to think about the consequences of legislation pertaining to them. Thanks. We have a, a few minutes for Questions um, up the back, Justine. Thank you so much, Simon. That's really interesting. Um, at the start of your talk, uh, you mentioned that this topic, I guess, because you referred to it as social responsibility, you know, um, and the humans. Sorry? As self destructive behaviour in humans. Did I? Yes, well, as yes. the thing is, essentially, we're doing something that's considered, you know, that's considered destructive behaviour. So I wondered whether, uh, you know, with this sort of research we're entering, you know, another area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, part of that question, I think, comes back to the notion of addiction itself, right? So, um, smoking fits really uncomfortably in frames of addiction. It's, it doesn't come from the same place. Um, and the best example of that, I suppose, is if you're a fagger, you don't become weird and strange when you're smoking. So you can still go to work, you can still do your stuff. It's only when you quit that you become intolerable and that you look like the rest of the addicts, right? So there is a distinction between those studies which look at the physical dependence of smoking and that they've never had purchase in anthropology. But, but the, the real purchase in anthropology, as I've tried to say, is that you've got to understand the social, right? Um, and even when a person is alone, that still comes to into play. So um, if you are experiencing loneliness, then cigarettes are not nicotine delivery devices, they're friends, right? And they become your, your social um, familiars and, and you, you can't do without them because then you would be undone entirely from the social world. So there's, it's that kind of um, relationship that's been examined the most fully rather than the physical side. Yep. Um, I just wanted to ask you to develop a bit further. I mean, you're talking about a whole lot of facticity, which in the yes. first 
programs were kind of yeah. directed at exposing the invisible interior damage. Yeah. Uh, and then you sort of contrasted that with the Indigenous woman, generic. Um, I've seen a number of those ads. I thought they were still showing. Like, oh, they still trot yeah. them out from time to time, right? But they're not they're not the new stuff. Yeah. Not, but I, I suppose I'm kind of interested in the kind of relational field that's constructed for Indigenous Australians, where clearly there's that idea of, you know, if, if you're prejudicing sociality, if you're prejudicing, you know, relations, then that's what you're sort of aiming for. With this kind of, I mean, there's obviously, when you're discussing, you know, secondhand smoke, thirdhand smoke, I mean, there's also an appeal to the idea of, you know, sticky family relations. Yeah. But in, in general, it's much more of a kind of a notion of a more isolated individual in relationship to a kind of anonymous public space. And just sort of flowing on from that, I suppose I'm interested in, I mean, you talked about air, and yeah. of course we think about air, you know, often not just in relationship to smoking, but pollution, global warming, etc. Yeah. So how far do you think there might be a kind of bit of a leakage of metaphors between all of the stuff about sort of, you know, air pollution and smoking? Yeah. And, and on the other hand, you know, this idea of a kind of, you know, a, a long-term sort of lingering of the residue of smoke, yeah. I mean, in some ways also influenced by, you know, metaphors and, and, and facts around sort of radioactivity. And I think just my final sort of PS on that question was, why are things, are so, di why are things so different in France? And is yeah, why can't character? we be like France? I've often asked myself that. Is the <laughs> character that you're positing in, in most places pertaining in France as well? No, um, France is not part of the four country alliance, right, which is um, us, Canada, US, UK. Um, that's a growing alliance. And there are, again, it's always constituted on this, oh, there's this whole set of social relations that are very different there. And you can't do this. You can't impose this kind of thing. And, you know, it's all about, you know, entailment with food and wine and all these kinds of other things. But I really like your question about metaphors. And I think it's really important to ask in relationship to the air, right, because the air has been... Um, there's a couple of things to say about it. I mean, the first thing I think is that we don't normally think about the air as having history. It takes away our pollution from space and from time and we don't see it. And that's why air has become so important in thinking about global warming and pollution because suddenly it does have a history and you can see it. So smog stays with us and that's a worry. It's a similar kind of situation with smoke because smoke wafts away right, and you can't see it anymore. But once you get to the idea that it doesn't and it sticks on you and that it remains, you dispense with that whole whole idea that smoke goes away and won't bother anyone. The air can't take care of it anymore, can't take it away. Neither, in fact, can water. And so all of the things that we used to rely on to cleanse the air cannot be relied upon anymore. I also like that metaphor because the air itself is not the social backdrop against which this occurs. It is thoroughly entailed in all of those practices I talked about. And it's used very effectively by the state to get these powerful you know, legislations into the very tin tacks of, or the micros of people's you know, um, bodily lives. So breathing, you know, the, the legislation works because it changes breathing. Right, or it changes how you breathe with others, or it changes... I mean, smoke's a very hard thing to control because it does move on the air. So I don't know if people remember in the room when um, in bars we'd have smoking sections and non-smoking sections, and the smoke would just go nut and just go like this across, right? So, but, so it was a, a nonsensical kind of thing. But now we don't have that anymore, but we still have this idea that if you're on a beach and someone's smoking over there, then it might come to you over here and this might still present a danger. So I think the air is actually really important and the idea of an assailant air that comes and attacks um, and does the work of the state but also the work of the public um, in, it, in its airy kind of travels. It also reminds me of theories of miasma, you know, the, this idea of rot, you know, and it being born on the wind and that if you happen to be in the way, you would, you would be beset by this assailant air that is miasmatically, you know, um, contaminated. So it's a really, they're, they're all really old ideas, I suppose, is my point. So none of what I'm saying is new. It's all, um, to me, a revisitation of things which have gone before. Yeah, so I think, thank you for your question. I think it's great. So in your book, you admit to being a smoker at certain times. Shame. Shame. <laughs> uh, it's not true. And I mean, just a super professorial role in everything you're saying about third and smoke, and you don't let me your students any longer. I'm just wondering, like, you know, as, as uh, I, I have a okay, um, conversation <laughs> with you. Uh, Thanks for that. The barefoot anthropologists, yeah, the engaged anthropologists, I wonder if you have, like, a 
personal stance on this that you clearly did not let on in your lecture or in your Because like, that's because I want to keep my job, right? Because <laughs> they just gave it to me. I don't want them to take it away. Because like, it's extra money and everything. Um, anyway, no, um, <laughs> it's helped me, right? smoking to from time to time so I I have never called myself a non-smoker and I don't frequently call myself a smoker either for obvious reasons so I don't want to be in either of those camps because I'm it doesn't matter what disclaimers I make about that I'll always be situated if I were one or the other in in those political terms I talked about but methodologically it has helped me no end to be a fagger and come up to people Right in the street and say, can I ask you about your smoking? Whereas if I've come up without one, people don't want to talk to me. They think I'm from the government. They they run away, right? They don't want to talk to me, and they they or they think I'm going to abuse them for smoking. Right. So it's been methodologically good for me to go to people, and I am planning on um, seeking you know recompense for my winning blues from the university at some point. Um, <laughs> talked about that later. Um, <laughs> So, and, and maybe retrospectively suing it for giving me cancer, but no, <laughs> Paul's, Paul's saying no about that. Um, but right now, I'm not a smoker, um, because, and that's because I, was, I had a recent diagnosis of throat cancer, which didn't turn out to be true, but it, it really scared me. So this works, this stuff, right? It's really quite frightening. Um, but yeah, the answer to that is that I, I, I don't have an ethical position per se, but I do have uh, a practical position that I've got to be very carefully um, attendant to during the management of my field work. I hope I don't become a third-hand contaminant lecturer, that, or that would get me out of teaching, which might be good. So, yeah. studying alcohol next. Yeah. <laughs> no need to. God. So I'm thinking about what, you, what you're saying as, as a, an illustration of how norms are created through yeah. violent means, right? So They're pretty violent. The yeah. Shocking images, the Indeed. violence of being horsemen, and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and part of what you seem to be saying is that there's a there's a real component of harm, physical bodily harm, that we yep. legitimately track here. Yeah. But then there's all the other stuff that kind of adds on to it. And I wonder if you really want to have that. I mean, I can see how that's useful to sort of steer your way through the rhetorical divide around pro and anti smoking. Yeah. Um, but 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 how far do you think that actual criterion of harm can can draw a line around how far the violence of your creation well, will go? I don't think violence is unusual though. I don't think it's in no. any way constrained with this field. And I think actually that touch itself, even within a family, is always a potential for violence and on the unfurling of violence. So I think that's what works because it is so ordinary and so normalised that you can hitch these things to it very, very easily. This is a remark I also made in respect of how the public has never been, you know, for everyone. And there are equally violent means which weed out, right, those, those people who aren't meant to be in that participatory public. And that is very obvious in white middle class countries. So we see this in all sorts of ways. I was recently in Liverpool where it's pretty, that violence is having trouble being enacted in the same way that it's being enacted here. I don't know if you've been to Liverpool, but you can't go up to a bunch of people who are smoking and abuse them because you will die, right? So that parallel research which has been carried out in Liverpool has, has a really um, different version of violence. It's much more out there, it's much more open, and it's coming from a different source, the opposite source from what we would experience here. But I, I think the subtlety of violence actually has taken me a long way here. So when I say violence, I don't just mean these particular acts we can call particularly violent. I think it's a property of social life and that it's been very usefully used and utilised in the management and the creation of the public. But I think it's an interesting question, so thanks. It's good to think about. Frank? Thanks. thanks. Um, I think my question is a little bit related to the last one. That is, I wanted to ask you about what this led you to by way of reflections on research on a topic where there is obviously an increasing you know, uh, scientific understanding of the actual objective harm yeah. of a particular practice, which has you know, come about over the last few decades. Uh, but in the, in the face of that um, sort of better understanding, what you and your collaborators might have come to think about how to prevent tobacco research from immediately falling into the category of tobacco control research. In other words, what you have thought about trying to keep those two things 
We've been very unsuccessful in that mission. If that was, was our mission, we, we screwed it up royally. It's not happening. Um, it's been impossible for us to create a space and, and there are really only four or five of us who do this sort of work um, and we're all roundly attacked all of the time for doing it. So all of us have made those observations relevant to other areas. So obviously one of the observations that I've made relevant to another area is in my own discipline, right? So what are the consequences for not looking at laudable practices? I think they're that uh, particular insight is very useful because we've seen it before and we keep repeating it in anthropology. We did it with illicit drugs research, right? And we, we keep doing it in certain kinds of ways, which is, of course, why I'm interested in alcohol now. So I haven't attempted to make that sternly about tobacco, although it is very interesting to think about it in the space of vaping, right? Which is having very different effects in the countries where that's uh, being introduced. Of course, vaping in Australia is treated exactly the same way as cigarettes. You can't do it. End of story. So I think there's there's a real um, question there about what relevance this has had, because I've been doing it for, for 15, 16 years now. So clearly there are lots of places where this has purchased. Um, I suppose one of the ones that probably Fletch uh, was talking to me about the other day was, what do you do with hate mail? Right? Should universities let researchers have hate mail? So that I don't know, Fletch, should they? We, don't, we haven't had this conversation yet, but it also raises questions about the kind of data that you get, um, from whom, how universities manage that, how they manage things like academic freedom. You're allowed to do this. This is um, my collaborator here, Jackie, who, who deals with that um, idea. So there's, there's all sorts of productive notions about it that don't rely on, well, we're now seeing tobacco validly being regarded as a dangerous thing. So. The questions are quite other, I think is the answer. The such is interesting that it seems that the, the smoker are dangerous, but the, the second smoke the second hand smoker carry the poison, but they are not dangerous anymore. They can touch the bait made of wrong. Second, um, it's interesting that I talk about injured people, because I do know that in the minority people in, in Central Asia, and especially in Malaya, even the idea of science, um, education of uh, public city and the hills, hygiene, all of this getting into um, that area. There's a huge strong resistance uh, because a lot of reason made just about talking about the high plateau and also there's a kind of scale of the home culture tradition yeah. that have a strong resistance against this kind of modern. It seems that there are two kind of channels, channels going around together. They don't really interact. Here it's a very kind of plain space where everything goes to each other, very influential and violent way. But in some areas, like in Central Asia, Himalayan areas, might not. Yeah, that's well. That's the big challenge, right? Um, for public health researchers, next. So, the first, um, the first kind of work, I suppose, was to get a hold of smoking in Western countries, and then it's it's increasing that. So, um, Matthew Corman and uh, Peter Benson, who I call Peter Benson and Hedges, and he really hates it, right, um, are the primary researchers in this space. And they're encountering just the kinds of things that you, you talk about. But they're both anthropologists. And so this does not shock them at all. It fits right into that whole idea that, well, you've really got to understand social circumstances under which this happens, the historical circumstances, and then you create very particular strategies. And so that, that's what it looks like the world over. And you have more countries partnering up um, to this world tobacco free kind of, um, uh, of project. So there's lots of money in it as well. They, they get funded amazing amounts right, to, to do this kind of research. Uh, whereas I get very little. Um, no one, no one wants to give me much money to do to do that. Okay, we um, we don't have time for any more questions, but we continue talking to Simone, talking to each other upstairs, where we have some catering. Um, just as a public health announcement, there will probably be soft cheese. I'd go for the yeah. hard cheese. <laughs> um, also, I smoked 15 years ago. Yes, I may be toxic. Mind. Don't stand too close. <laughs> Um, but thank you very much, Simone. Thanks thank you for all for coming. Thank that you. That was very good. Thank, thank you. you.